Hello everybody, E here. Welcome back to another spoiler discussion. Today we are going to be talking about Black House by Stephen King and Peter Straub. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, I know I mentioned this in the Talisman one, but uh, the uh, the cover for this one is only slightly better, 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 yeah, better. Uh, there's the no trespassing sign whatnot. But uh, I never was a huge fan of the hardcover, which was just a footprint and a house that does not fit the uh, the picture of the house at all. So I don't know why the uh, I don't know why the the Straub and King books have such terrible covers, but they do. And this is a first. This is a first first, um, and it's also really cheaply made like they didn't have any uh i don't know how to put it uh they didn't they didn't think it would do well you know they didn't think they'd make they make their money back off of it but then again we have things like let's see here this cash grab which was uh the reissue of bag of bones and hardcover to go with the scribner classics and this thing is a wobbly piece of shit too so um i don't know Maybe it's just his publisher not believing in that era of books. I don't know, um, because uh, how far how far apart were these books? Let's see here. That one, of course, was new. This was in 2001, right? Yeah, 2001. I didn't even have to look that up. But uh, you got 2001 there. Sorry, I'm, I went full, I'm going full geek for this video. I want to see how close they are. Uh, I believe this one was just before his accident, so 99? Yeah. Maybe it's just that era, 98. Maybe it's just that era of, what, Scrivener? No, that's Random House. They went with uh, Straub's publisher. Never mind. Completely different publisher. So, anyways, now that we got that, all that out of the way, <laughs> um, the uh, I, I like this one a lot. Like I said in the review video, there's also going to be a Thursday Theorist video. Um, hopefully, it'll be up after, right after this one. Um, but the... The, the thing that I like the most about it is that Straub and King's voices came together. Um, I know someone had mentioned that in a video that they watched that either King or Straub said that they tried to mimic each other. You can really tell that here because the, the styles don't clash. Um, there's tons and tons of, uh, of scenes where you can, you can almost feel Straub trying to play King, but it's not quite King because Straub can't get that, he, he doesn't have that conversational tone that King does. Uh, now, am I 100% certain that King didn't actually write those segments? Probably not. Um, did I highlight them to read them off to you? <laughs> no, I did not. I apologize. Um, but the... I, I, I recall in the Talisman always, always going, well, Straub wrote this, well, King wrote that. And it's very few times in this book that I feel that way. Um, but as far as the spoiler discussion, I, when I did the one for Carrie, I realized my, my, my fatal flaw, even though you guys, d you know, decidedly liked that, that video, I was just doing a breakdown of the plot, and that's not really what a spoiler discussion is. I don't think that's what a spoiler discussion is, and I don't know why I did a video like that. Um, but what I want to do with this is I want to talk about, you know, in-depth spoilers of the things that I liked and I didn't like. Um, so that's what we're going to do from here on out. Uh, luckily, this is only my second spoiler discussion. Uh, the first one was Carrie, and I might go back, delete that one, and just reshoot that whole one. Let me know what you guys think down there in the doobly-doo. Um, but with this one, right off the bat, you get that sense, uh, like you're being told a story by an old friend. Uh, they open it up and you're, you're, you're above the city, you're looking out as if you're God. Um, and that's basically how they treat themselves. There is a part in the book that says where, uh, uh, your two storytellers or the storytellers working on this book understand that you can stop the book here. I, I like that. Um, that was, uh, that 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 little bit there, like not only do we have this uh, this godlike omniscient POV for the book, but they're even referencing that there's two uh, gods in this case, uh, two two storytellers. So I appreciated that. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the book um, is the bad guy uh, Burnside. <laughs> he was batshit crazy. Um, I, I I I loved it, uh, and I mentioned. Uh, in the review 
how one person mentioned that all he remembers about this book was the ass eating. There is no eating of butt meat in the book, but there is much discussion about the eating of butt meat. But there's only like, I, and not talking about tossing a salad or licking someone's butthole, literally eating, you know, butt, rump, rump roast, <laughs> literally eating the butt meat of uh, these kids that he's murdering. Um, and there's only like five or six pages worth of content regarding that, but then this, this person, and it's, it's going to stick with me forever, man. This person's comment about the, you know, the, the book was only about eating ass, and I, I find that funny. Um, but I, I didn't realize, you know, how much they took away from Albert Fish to write this book, uh, especially uh, the, f the first time I read the book, I was, you know, fucked up on heroin at the time. In fact, I think I was going uh, through a self-imposed rehab at the time when I read the book for the first time. And I didn't know much about Albert Fish then. I know a little bit more about Albert Fish now, but I didn't put the two and two together. In fact, back then, I'm pretty sure I thought that Albert Fish was a fictional character. Um, the, that they, you know, they just created for the story. Um, come to find out he was a, a real killer. Um, it also brings to mind H.H. H. Holmes. Uh, it, it actually bring him up. H.H. H. Holmes... Uh, Dahmer, Gacy, you know, other cannibals, uh, famous cannibals throughout the years and ages. Um, but one of my favorite parts is, is that character's, like, not really character arc, um, but it's the idea of him being, um, this, not, not innocuous, um, this, this character hidden away in this nursing home, and everybody thinks he's crazy, he's got dementia or whatever, but he's got this sordid back history with the, the mafia, um, or maybe it wasn't the Mafia. I can't, I can't exactly remember, but he's got this history back in Chicago. Uh, that was, that had happened earlier in his life, and I remember really enjoying the villain this time. Whereas in The Talisman, uh, Richard, not Richard, um, Morgan Sloat, he just didn't do anything for me. And that was one of the main problems I had with The Talisman, is none of the characters really did anything for me. In this one, you have Henry. Um, you, Jack is great in this one. Jack is a great adult character. I didn't care too much for him as a kid. But you also had Charles Burnside. Uh, you had the guy, um, you had all the bikers, Doc, Beezer, um, a couple other ones. I can't, I can't remember all their names right now. They're, they're finally starting to fade. But while I was reading the book, they were just about as alive as can be for me. Um, but you had, uh, this character stuck away in the, the nursing home no one was paying attention to, and he got, he literally got away with murder. Um, and it was interesting as they were going through it, you know, he was going to frame this one person, and then that person ended up, you know, a, what was it, an alibi? I can't even remember what it was, but they automatically knew that, of course, this dude wasn't the case. And me and uh, the, the Angela, the person that I read the book with, we were like, well, they're obviously going to breeze right over that because there's not too much of the book left, and we're not going to have some kind of murder investigation. And then he up, they up and killed Henry. I was... I was, I was really shocked, but that scene, going back to, you know, one of my favorite parts of the book, is Henry throwing down, this blind man throwing down with, uh, with Charles Burnside. I, I appreciated that. It's so much fun watching King, I don't know if Straub has a history of doing this, watching King make a character live as long as humanly possible. So many authors are like, oh, he cut his throat and he died. But with King, it's like, if the wound is not fatal, he's going to keep that character <laughs> around for a while to either have emotional content. I'm put this book down because I hear it popping in the background and mess with me messing with the spine. Um, he's either going to have an emotional ending or he's going to have a tragic or not tragic, but a, a funny ending. And it's funny. It's, it's strange to me that he did both. You have the emotional ending with uh, Henry, and then you have this funny, dark... Uh, the darkly humorous, disgusting ending for Burnside when Tyler crushes dude's testicles. I just, I noped out. I, my mind completely just, you know, le left the area. It's like, fuck it, I'm not reading anything else right now. Um, I remember Angela bringing up uh, how much she liked that part. I love the whole, the whole character arc for Burnside. It's probably my favorite part about the book. And I, now that I've sat on the book for about a week, and I thought about it. I think Burnside was my favorite character in the book, honestly, other than Henry. Um, Henry was probably my favorite good, good, you know, good guy. 
um, him playing the four different characters. At one point in time, I thought that the DJ and, you know, and Henry were two completely different. Now, the guy who dressed in the suits and went out to the, uh, the... The nursing home, he went out there to, to, to DJ the nursing home. That's a great scene, by the way. The writing is pitch perfect for that scene. Um, it almost has a beat you can dance to during a dance. It's really cool. If you're a writer or you're a fan of the craft, go back and read just that scene. And that that has a rhythm to it. The the cadence of the words, the, the structure, it's just fascinating to me. And I probably read that part three times before moving on. I'm really, really huge fan of that part. Um, but as as far as uh, me forgetting who this guy was, I, it said really early on in the book that he was uh, one man who was actually four different people. Um, and what that's funny to me is the first time I read this book back in 2001, I was coming off of heroin. This time, for the first 200 pages of this book, it was all kind of muddy for me. I had to talk to Angela about some things. It was all kind of muddy for me because I was on some super strong shit. Uh, they had me on fentanyl uh, there, <laughs> there for a little while, and I didn't want to bring it up while I was on the stuff because I didn't want anybody to worry about me with my history with heroin and everything, but that was the medication they had me on. Um, and it and it's synthetically similar to heroin so and so is dilaudid is this extremely high opiate painkiller so the first 200 pages of this reread i was in the same mindset as back then so i took those all those other characters the radio host the dj henry was it george rathburn is the one that's on the radio and then you have the dj uh henry and all that all that stuff i actually thought for a minute there that henry was was a black dude um, because of the way that he, they describe him doing the DJ stuff. Um, so I thought that was, that was interesting. But, uh, the, it's just the way the, the medicine messed with my mind that I actually made these characters into other, you know, into other characters when it was just that one person. I thought that was funny. And Angela, I can only imagine Angela's going, wait a second. Oh, actually, she did say this in a, in a, uh, um, an email. It was like, wait, you're the one who's supposed to be the expert on this stuff. And I'm, it was like, I'm sorry. I'm actually on drugs right now, <laughs> literally on drugs. But uh, another part is uh, something that will come up in the Thursday Theorist. I had no idea that this book or that Revival connected to this book so cementally. Um, not cementally? Is that co so concretely? <laughs> like, it, it, the, these two books are, are pieces of each other. Um, if you've read Revival and you've read Black House, you will notice how close, not close, how much they connect. Um, and Angela found some stuff also that um, that I just kind of breezed over, and like I said, we'll talk about all this stuff in uh, Thursday Theorist. But she went back, she went and read Revival right after reading Black House, and I think that's what I'm going to do on my reread this time. And yes, I'm going to be doing these books again in my reread. I'll probably just speed through them in a in an audio book. But the <laughs> the uh, the, the connections were, I, they're, they're obviously there. So now I'm wondering, and I've always, I've long said that um, that Revival was probably sitting around the King compound forever before, I'm pretty sure it was a Trump novel or something that he was going to release under the Bachman name or whatever it might have been. I've long said that that book is older than what we think it is. And now I kind of think that he wrote Revival and Black House around the same time. Um, who knows when they were published? Um, Peter Straub takes forever to release a book, uh, and yet, you know, this one came out in 2001, so how far back had they actually written it before it was published? That kind of thing. And 2001, that's right after his accident, I mean, he pumped out the trilogy of trash, of, co of course, what, From a Buick 8 was already halfway done, or mostly done, before he had his car accident, and then he came back and uh, finished it afterwards, so that completely... Uh, it, it, we understand why that book is so bad. Um, Dreamcatcher was bad because he was in so much pain. Um, and I don't know what the hell happened with Cell. <laughs> I think he was just out of his mind, uh, you know, not th thinking he had lost something uh, when he wrote Cell. But uh, when Black House came out around that time, and of course he was also working on the, or at, had finished working on whatever, I'm thinking he was working on the last, three Dark Tower books. Um, I don't know how far along he was or anything like that, or if he'd even started them before his accident. Um, 
But of course, this one ties in directly too. It can be alluded to the talisman tie tying into um, Eyes of the Dragon, the Dark Tower series. It can be alluded to that. But this one straight up references the Crimson King. So, you know, of course, it's going to tie into that. And we'll cover more of that stuff when we do the Thursday Theorist. But um, as far as this one is concerned, there's some, others, there's some other stuff. I think the only part I really didn't like came in the middle, and I was kind of worried that we were going to slam on brakes and just be stuck in this diner or Ed's Eats uh, forever. <laughs> I just I felt like that scene was just going to go on forever, and I was like, oh, another another time, because I had the same problem with Talisman. Another time, they've gotten to the middle of the book, they have no idea where they're going to go, and now we're stuck here spinning wheels, because they just kept on describing, you know, different sections of that scene in different ways. Uh, pretty much just saying the same thing over and over again. Everybody's getting into position for this one, you know, reveal of the, the the child that's been, you know, mutilated and eaten and whatnot. And it just kept on going. That scene goes on forever, but it's nowhere near as long as the stuff that's in the, the I guess, the, what was it, uh, Sunshine Grove or whatever it was called in the Talisman. Nowhere near as boring as all that stuff. At least there's something going on. Um, and yes, there's the escape in the Talisman, but... That I thought I think I thought that was too little, too late kind of deal. With this one, I appreciated the uh, the use of the journalist character. The journalist, uh, what was his name? Wendell Green. Again, Green is another big theme of the book. I don't think it's as big as it was in the Talisman, but with this one, Wendell Green is probably my least favorite character, but probably only because I've seen this character from King before. He kind of felt like a, a twinner for, uh, what's his name, Richard something, Rich, Richard Dees, I think it is, from the Night Flyer. Um, works for Inside Edition. It kind of felt like he was the same dude there. Um, and I think Richard Dees, wasn't he even in uh, the Dark Half, I think? I, I know that character pops, or pops around a lot. I'll do some more research before I do Thursday Theorist. But uh, that's kind of what Wendell Green, and if I'm getting the first name wrong, I apologize. I'm pretty sure it's Wendell Green. But uh, the journalist character, I, I think that's why I just felt like I've seen that character from King a lot. Um, it's kind of like the abusive, alcoholic husband. We've seen that character that wears a wife beater. We've seen that character so many damn times. You know, just pack him up and put him away. And I think King pretty much has at this point, which I appreciate. You know, it's not like the dogs in Dean Koontz books where they're just kind of always there even when they're not there. Um, there's at least a mention of a super smart dog. Uh, but with the, the, one, the one thing about this book that will probably stay with me the most, though, is the writing. Um, the, the story's fun, the story's great, but I'm still so impressed with how they did their writing. And there's, a, there's quite a few people who've expressed their, not their concern, but their, how irritated they got at the, uh, the omniscient point of view. And I, while I understand that, I disagree. I think that's the best part of the book. Um, I think the way they t chose to, to tell this story is the best part of the book. Now, there, there are scenes where it hurts. Uh, like the you know with Jack at the end getting shot up and you know stuck in the territories and he'll never be able to come home for long again. I think that that section was the the power of that section was ruined there at the end with the for, with the forced foreshadowing. Um, I, I can't remember who it was, but somebody else mentioned you know uh, I don't know if it was on on this review or not, but someone else mentioned that uh, omniscient is great as long as there isn't too much forced foreshadowing. Um, and I think that was one of the times in this book where that was way too forced. And why would you tell us that Jack's going to die before you do it? There's so much more of a punch later on. Now, there are times when King has done that when I've appreciated it. Like um, in Spoilers for Pet Cemetery. So if you want to click away, Spoilers for Pet Cemetery, please go away if you don't want to hear spoilers. When Gage dies in Pet Cemetery. King is setting that up throughout the whole the whole front of the book. He's setting it up, but it's also a child. You know, it's kind of preparing because he he was bound to lose everybody. You know, kind of like he did with the the whole Cujo thing with hurting the hurting the dog. You know, this dog's running around killing people. People are like, oh, poor Cujo. Yeah, poor Cujo. But what about all the people he ate? Um, and then it, in Pet Cemetery, you know, he kind of he pads. He lets you know this kid is going to die. So, you know, don't get too attached, but get just attached enough so I can break your heart. Now, that kind of forced foreshadowing I enjoyed. But with this one, I don't think we need to be told that. Now, there is a twist. 
Jack ain't dead. He's just uh, he just can't come over to this world anymore. Now, um, here's some speculation. Here's a freebie speculation video for you for uh, the the institute. I firmly believe now. I could be completely wrong. I've been wrong before. That the institute is our third Jack Sawyer or third Talisman novel without Straub attached. Um, I don't think, I, I think Straub and King had like a parting of ways because Straub has been really, really, really upset as far as, you know, the, how he's been treated since the Talisman came out and Black House and on top of that with how people have just kind of ignored his input into those books. And it's a dick move by us fans, but I mean, they are Stephen King books. He did agree to come play in Stephen King's universe. Um, if there are sections of the universe that are Peter Straub's, then so what can we say at this point? You've decided to come over here. You have the Crimson King. You got all that stuff from the Dark Tower universe. It's a Stephen King book. You're playing in his sandbox. It's kind of like, you know, Black House. Stephen King presents Black House with a special appearance by Peter Straub. Now, did he do half the work? Probably. Did he do more of the work in this one? He might have. I don't know, because there's a lot of stuff in here that feels like Straub. But if we got King purposefully trying to mimic his style, I'm sure King can do that, because King is a terrific mimic. Um, it, especially if you pick apart uh, the Bizarre of Bad Dreams, where he goes through and tells you what authors inspired what stories. If you go and read those other authors, You'll understand, you'll, you'll understand the connections almost immediately. Um, he does a fantastic job of being a mimic. I think that's why he's so great, because he can do damn near anything, or anybody. He can mimic anybody. Um, with, with this book, that I have so many pleasant memories about reading this book. One of, the big ple one of the biggest pleasant memories is reading it with Angela. That was a lot of fun. I hope to read more stuff with her. So, Angela, if you're watching this, it was a blast. I really enjoyed reading it with you. Um, another thing is there were so many small moments of perfect, pitch-perfect writing that I can't fault the book whatsoever. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I want to put it on my top five list. But the problem with that top five list for my Stephen King books is I still like those other books better, but I want to hold this one up to the level of those. So let's call this book 5.5 on my top five list of all time. Um, I know we, we've talked about Black House before, but this time, open up with the spoilers uh, down there in the doobly-doo. Please tell me your favorite and least favorite sections. You don't even have to give a spoiler warning, because honestly, if people come across this video with spoiler discussion in the tag, they, they deserve to be spoiled, let's be honest. But anyways, leave all your comments down there in the doobly-doo. I'll talk to you guys there, but until next time, I have been E, you have been you. This has been the spoiler discussion video. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye!